Larry Dossey um, is a, 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 a person kind of to be at the beginning of this program because as um, Paul Cummins just told you the kind of Gaian story of the earth, Larry's got the story of the, uh, the band of reality that's beyond uh, this ordinary reality. And he uh, is such a really uh, first class representative of all of the, that kind of realm, the psi realm that Craig was talking about before. Uh, I told you you could read everybody's credits, but he was chief of staff of a hospital. He's an internal medicine physician uh, and has written many books, has a huge following, deservedly so, and speaks about the relationship between the body and consciousness, my favorite kind of topic. So, my great pleasure to introduce you to Dr. Larry Dossey. Thank you, dear. Thank you. I am really glad you're here. I'm really glad I'm here. <laughs> now, I want to tell you what I'm going to talk about uh, by referring to the very best book review I've ever had in my life which was given back in 1982 when my first book was published, a book called Space, Time, and Medicine. Someone asked my mother, after the book was out, what do you think about Larry's new book? And my mom, without any hesitation whatsoever, said, well, I can't understand a word of it. <laughs> but if my boy wrote it, it's right. So I'm just going to talk to you about what's right today. That's not, uh, well, my field, as Suzanne uh, generously mentioned, uh, has been uh, internal medicine for uh, most of my adult life, but I've had a side interest also. And it has to do with the fact that I, I was born very early in life uh, <laughs> as, as an identical twin. And all of my life, my twin brother and I have had stuff going back and forth between us, which we just call twin stuff. And it has to do with things that are very difficult to describe. Shared thoughts and sensations and feelings and sometimes physical symptoms, even while we are great distances apart. And uh, to compound this twin thing, uh, I happen to be married to a twin. This is my wife, Barbara. She is a fraternal twin, and she and her twin brother have had this stuff in spades going on in their life. So our household has been sort of a twin laboratory for a lot of weird stuff for as long as I can remember. Now, there is a huge literature about this which drives skeptics nuts. It's almost always neglected. It's not in the textbooks. But if you search it out, it's not difficult to find. One of the pioneers who really put this field on the map was the uh, well-known psychiatrist from the University of Virginia who uh, has written widely with respect to children who remember past lives. He had another interest, which was the shared distant kind of symptoms which are inexplicable conventionally. He called them telesomatic impre telepathic impressions, but if you go looking in the literature, the term you will find is something called telesomatic events. If you want to have your mind blown about this stuff, this is the go-to book. It's Twin Telepathy by the British consciousness researcher uh, Guy Playfair. Now, let me describe one of these things to you because this really brings the mind-body connection and the brain and consciousness connection into real focus and illuminates the problems therein. Uh, first of all, we know that about 30% of identical twins have these sorts of distant, remote, non-local connections, and this is what they look like. This case was reported from the 1970s. It dealt with uh, uh, four-year-old twin girls in northern Spain, Sylvia and Marta Landa. Well, Marta was taken by the father to the grandparents' house many miles away. Sylvia stayed home with her mom. Unfortunately, as the mother was ironing, Sylvia put her hand on a red-hot iron and erupted in a second-degree blister. And at the same time, miles and miles away at the grandparents' house, Marta erupted 
with the same sort of blister on the same hand, the same pattern, and in the same place on the palm. Go figure. Now, I began having another category of weird experiences the very first year I was in internal medicine practice. Uh, this took the form of precognitive dreams. For some reason, I began to dream about events that would play out in the lives of patients I would see the next day. I, I found this very unnerving. I realized immediately that if I began to talk about this publicly, this would not be the very best way to advance my career in medicine. <laughs> But uh, this stuff would not go away, largely because when my, uh, the nurses who I worked with in the hospital found out that I had an interest in this, they began to shower me with their own experiences along these lines. And my patients began to report their experiences about precognitive dreams in which they would dream their diagnosis and sometimes the treatment, which when they came to me the next day would play out in their life. The last uh, uh, leg on that three-legged stool was when my colleagues began to share their experiences with me, and they would usually preface uh, their story with something like this. You know, I've never told anybody this in my life. But you could tell that this had deep meaning for them, and they needed to express it and get it out. Uh, I'll never forget a uh, lecture I gave at a Harvard Medical School conference for continuing medical education for internal medicine doctors in which I was talking about these kinds of experiences and how common that I suspect they are in my profession. And uh, during the Q&A session, a very uh, uh, earnest uh, female internist stood up in the middle of this group and she said, well, I want to confess my story. She said, I get numbers in my dreams. She said, I dreamed these specific laboratory values of my patient's lab tests before I even ordered the tests. And that was just a warm-up. And it went from there. I think this is one of the best-kept secrets in modern medicine. It also is one of the biggest problems in modern medicine because, uh, as I've already implied, this stuff is not in the textbooks. And uh, officially, these things just cannot happen. Now. It's interesting to look at the way these prohibitions uh, are phrased. This is from Carl Sagan, the famous astronomer. The brain's workings, what we sometimes loosely refer to as the mind, are a consequence of the brain's anatomy and physiology and absolutely nothing more. This is uh, the materialistic approach that dominates the conversation these days, as uh, Greg Weiler is always ready to describe. It's not difficult to find these things. John Searle, one of the leading mind-body philosophers uh, in the country uh, at UC Berkeley, says this, consciousness can't spread over the universe like a thin veneer jam. There has to be a point where my consciousness ends and yours begins. Now, if you fool around in this area, you will understand immediately that these conversations and dialogues often get very overheated. And sometimes it's at a point where we just simply need to sit down, shut up, and take a deep breath and ask seriously some fundamental questions. Among them is how in the world could a physical brain produce consciousness in the first place? Uh, this is not often done. But when serious people address this, they often come out with some things that make them look like a deserter to the skeptic's cause. Uh, this is a, uh, uh, such a comment from Steven Pinker, the well-known environmental, uh, excuse me, the experimental psychologist from Harvard University. He was once asked, how is it that consciousness is produced by the brain? And he said, beats the heck out of me. Uh, I have some prejudice prejudices, but I have no idea, no idea how to begin to look for a defensible answer, and neither does anybody else. So Stephen uh, Stuart Kaufman, the theoretical biologist and complex systems theorist, says much the same thing. Uh, Professor Kaufman says, nobody has the faintest idea what consciousness is. I don't have any idea. 
nor does anybody else, including the philosophers of mind. I love these comments. I don't know why. It's something good. Freeman Dyson, one of the most famous physicists of our time, says, the origin of life is a total mystery, and so is the existence of human consciousness. We have no clear idea how the electrical discharges occurring in nerve cells in our brain are connected with our feelings and desires and actions. Jerry Fodor, one of the most prestigious mind-body philosophers uh, at Rutgers, nobody, nobody has the slightest idea how anything material could be conscious. Nobody even knows what it would be like to have the slightest idea how anything material such as the brain could be conscious. So much for the philosophy of consciousness. This from one of the most prestigious mind-body philosophers in our country. Donald Hoffman, my favorite cognitive scientist at UC Irvine, sums it up. The scientific study of consciousness is the embarrassing, in the embarrassing position of having no scientific theory of consciousness. Folks, this is where we are in this debate. And when you hear skeptics offer these arrogant and presumptuous uh, comments that we figured it out and you people are wrong, it's all in the brain, you don't have to go there. And the conventional view of separateness, separation, individual brains and minds and, and, and whole people, the whole premise of separation among human beings uh, I want to contend is false. And this is one of those false stories that we have been dragooned into accepting as fact. And in fact, when we look at empirical observations, we see that minds are not separate, they're connected. So what does this evidence look like? Well, let's go down to the component of brains, which are neurons. If you take a bunch of human neurons and put them in a petri dish and put them in something called a Faraday cage, which is shielded optically and electromagnetically, and you do the same thing with another batch and put them over here, way uh, in another Faraday cage, so that these things cannot possibly have any sort of physical communication with each other, and you stimulate one of them, one batch with a laser light, the other one changes instantly in the same way. Uh, this makes skeptics go crazy. This is not supposed to happen. But it does happen, and this, these studies have been replicated by the same group and with other groups uh, as well. And if you want to look at the data, this is Dr. Rita Pizzi in Italy who pioneered this particular methodology. She says, our, exper our experimental data seem to suggest strongly that biological systems present non-local properties not explainable by classical models. So you can go to huge collections of neurons, not just a few neurons in petri dishes. Our favorite large connection of neurons is our own brain. And if you take people and wire them up with an EEG over here and send somebody a long way off, also wired up to have an electroencephalogram brainwave tracing made, and you stimulate one brain, if these people are emotionally close, the other individual's brain changes instantly in the same pattern. You can switch off from EEG to functional magnetic imaging, resonance imaging, and see the same uh, simultaneous uh, transitions go on. Here is a body of information not a lot of people know about. It's called social network connections. It shows not just unification between distant neurons or distant brains, but whole groups of people tend to be unified as well. Uh, this work came out of uh, the investigations by Dr. James Fowler, who's a political scientist at UC San Diego, and also Nicholas Christakis, who is a doctor and social scientist at Harvard Medical School. This data has been published in the British Medical Journal and the New England Journal of Medicine, and this is what it looks like. Chris Stackis says, happiness is contagious. Your happiness depends not just on your choices and actions, but also on the choices and actions of people you don't even know, who are one, two, and three degrees removed from you. 
Fowler says, if your friend's friend's friend becomes happy, that has a bigger impact on your being happy than if somebody put an extra $5,000 in your pocket. <laughs> you want to try? <laughs> you know, volunteer for that one. Christakis sums up, emotions have a collective existence. They're not just an individual phenomenon. And so how could this stuff work? I mean, whether you're a skeptic or a devotee and proponent, we all want to know how it works. Well, here's how it works, and I'm happy I'm here to reveal this to you because you can take this explanation to the bank. As Sir Arthur Eddington said in another context, something unknown is doing we don't know what. Uh, this has become my favorite go-to explanation for everything. The leading hypothesis, and for the skeptics, I emphasize this is not a theory, this is a hypothesis, has to do with a quantum explanation based in a phenomenon called entanglement, which is a term that the Nobel Prize winning physicist Erwin Schrodinger advanced in the 1920s. This is how Dean Radin, chief scientist at the Institute of Noetic Sciences, uh, sees entanglement. Minds are entangled with the universe, so in principle, minds can non-locally influence anything, including a collection of other minds or physical uh, systems. And so if we look at the picture that is beginning to emerge, what is the new story of consciousness that's coming into view? It is one in which consciousness is non-local, by which, among other things, we mean that it is unbounded. And because you can't put it in a box and wall it off from all the other consciousnesses out there, in some dimension, at some level, consciousness come together uh, in unity. And as a consequence of non-local unified minds, you can share wisdom and insight and creativity with other people. You don't have to be the smartest person in the room. If somebody in the room is smart, you can tap into that. There isn't even any room in non-local, unbounded awareness. Now, there are some very smart people who have understood the reality of this. Uh, this is never acknowledged, uh, for the most part. Uh, among them was Thomas Edison, American's great inventor, who said, people say, I've created things. I've never created anything. I get impressions from the universe at large and I work them out, but I'm only a plate on a record or a receiving apparatus, what you will. Thoughts are really impressions that we get from the outside. I think Edison was really a, a, a non-local kind of guy. <laughs> uh, so in this emerging picture of consciousness, isolation is simply a fiction. It's impossible in principle where consciousness is concerned. In this emerging picture, consciousness is communal. And community, therefore, gets back literally to what its etymology is. It's about communion. It's, community is about communing. And non-locality and entanglement permit that sort of thing. And so we don't have to engineer or invent this unity stuff. It, it's hardwired. It, it's factory installed. It's part of our original equipment. It is our birthright. So we only have to wake up to it, not invent it. And there's some deeper implications I want to note. You see, if consciousness is non-local or infinite in space and time, then in some sense it's eternal and immortal. Why immortal? because temporal non-locality is the very meaning of immortality and, and eternality. And so this idea then of non-local infinite and unbounded consciousness begins to resemble the old horrifying idea of the soul. It's an aspect of who we are that has no beginning, no limit, no end, and is immortal, eternal, and boundless. And so this begins to allow us to resurrect what our ancestors used to refer to as the universal mind, and which the physicist Schrodinger called the one mind. 
uh, as he expressed it, the overall number of minds is just one. In truth, this Nobel physicist said, in truth, there is only one mind. And if you will hang on to the fall, there is a brilliant book coming out. <laughs> it is called One Mind, which I happened to write. There are ethical implications of this uh, unitary mind. One which interests me as a physician is that if we're all connected, then there's always a collective global aspect to personal health, uh, so that health is never really personal. Uh, if consciousness is unitary and it comes together, then the health of one person affects the health of everybody. And this allows us to rephrase the golden rule from something like uh, this selfish conventional expression, do unto others as you would have them do unto you, to something like this. You better be compassionate to other people because in some sense, they are you. As Bohm said, physicist David Bohm, deep down the consciousness of mankind is one. As Thich Nhat Hanh said, you're me, I am you, isn't it obvious that we enter our? Nothing we do, however virtuous, can be accomplished alone the theologian Reinhold Niebuhr said, as Luciano de Crescenzo, the author, said, we are each of us angels with only one wing, and we can only fly by embracing each other. Thank you. <laughs>